Welcome back, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these videos, you can head over to patreon.com slash aksum. It's a new slash. It's a little simpler. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash A-K-S-U-M. You can also directly subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're one of our followers on YouTube today. Our special guest is Father Mark Bulos. You may hear me slip into Abuna, uh, and that's an easier way to say it in both of our traditions. Welcome to the program, Father Mark. It's good to be here. I'm a big fan. Love <laughs> all all of your programs. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. I began as Father Mark's fan some seven years ago in sometime around 2014, beginning by reading some of his and the other members of his parish, St. Elizabeth's exegetical notes on scripture, and then to become a listener of his audio podcast, The Bible is Literature, which has uh, since rapidly expanded. And, and I want to get into that, but, you know, everyone's journey through scripture is different. I wonder, Father Mark, if you could share with us any early memories you have of, of hearing scripture, whether it was in the liturgy or whether you, you had something at home or in school? I learned to read, actually, on scripture. I was a kid. I must have been uh, in first grade in the Catholic school system, and it was Sister Mary Joel. I used to have reading lessons. In between class, I would be tutored. I was in remedial reading, and I would sit with her and read the New Testament over and over and over again. I was a very impatient student. <laughs> I was very bored with whatever books they were using in class, but she was able to sit down with me and read scripture. And that's how it began. I learned I'm very much indebted to the Sisters of St. Joseph, who were very active in the Twin Cities area in Minnesota in the Catholic Church. And uh, it, was, it was their order that uh, ran the schools that I participated in as a young man, and it was their order that introduced me to Scripture and taught me Scripture. And that very much informed my hearing of Scripture in the Orthodox tradition where I grew up. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And I imagine they were helping you go through the New Testament in, in English at the time. I don't think they were imposing uh, the Vulgate Latin on you. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, we didn't learn Latin. That would, have been, that would have been wonderful. That would have been amazing. But yeah, we set, you, you... We set the bar too low in education <laughs> these days. Yeah, the, the the that's an interesting debate that that went on in in Ethiopia over various regimes about having kind of the consequence of less people knowing it more thoroughly uh, or more people knowing it less so when when you switch from a, a vernacular to a more from a technical language to to the vernacular. But but you said you uh, grew up in the Orthodox Church. I imagine you heard it in different languages. Did you grow up hearing it in Arabic and in, in Greek as well, or only in English? I mean, mostly in English, but in, in mm -hmm. Arabic and in Greek. I mean, I was always fascinated with languages and with tradition and with culture as a child because my parents were immigrants. And as with any immigrant family, there's always a tension between the quote new culture and the old culture i was of the mind that the old culture was more interesting <laughs> i was interested in history i was interested in religion and my father was very proud especially my father was very proud of his egyptian heritage he did not choose to come to the united states he didn't come here to become part of this culture he came here out of necessity and he could have landed anywhere else. This just happened to be where he came. And that had a lot to do with his attitude. So he never stopped being proud of where he came from. He had no trouble integrating here, but he never stopped being an Egyptian either. And he was very proud of his heritage that had a huge impact on me as a child and uh, shaped my attitude. He also was 
as an educated man from a poor country, uh, very critical of this culture and uh, very allergic to materialism, allergic to individualism. That was also very formative for me and in a way opened my ears to the hearing of the gospel later in life. But that was helpful for me as a young man and pushed me in the direction of being interested in languages and culture. And so a lot of the Arabic that I heard in church was because I took the time to find old tapes before the internet, mm -hmm. old recordings of the liturgy, and listen to the Treparia, listen to the Kantakia, and memorize them. So I would memorize the hymns in Arabic and memorize them in Greek before I could actually read the letters on the page. And I would go over the pronunciation, and I would learn the Egyptian pronunciation of the Arabic, and I would learn the Syro-Palestinian pronunciation of the Arabic, and then I would recite it in church. That's how it started for me. Wow, and that was that common in your batch or, or no? That's something I did because I was curious and interested. And that's what I regret very much about the anti-intellectualism in this country. That, in my mind, is something to be encouraged because of mm -hmm. education, not discouraged because of nationalism. It's funny, we critique the use of languages because we claim to be fighting nationalism without realizing we're imposing a different kind of nationalism. When what we should be interested in is education. If someone wants to learn Latin or pray in Latin, we should buy them a Latin grammar because so much is to be gained for all of us when one person studies Latin or Hebrew or Amharic or Arabic or Greek or French or German. And that's an especially urgent lesson for the United States. Amen, let us attend. And you took this interest further than just the languages of the liturgy, but you wanted to have this interest involved with the original languages of scripture. I imagine most seminarians have to dabble in it, but you seem to have gone uh, a lot of the way beyond the requirements of whatever St. Vladimir's may have required for you in, in Hebrew and Greek. Can you talk to us about how you learned the original languages of scripture and what import there is to read in Greek and Hebrew as, as opposed to whatever it is we're reading in? I was by no means the best. I wasn't even close to the best Greek student at seminary. I wasn't even close to the best Hebrew student at seminary. There were many people who were much better at the grammar and worked harder at the languages than I did. I think I was fortunate though because I was surrounded by people uh, after seminary and I continued to work at it for the long haul. And over time, just through persistence, you continue to develop your, your knowledge, both passive and active of vocabulary and grammar. So it was about the long-term investment in Bible study. I will say too that had it not been specifically for Father Paul Tarazi, I wouldn't have made much progress at all in the area of biblical studies or, or languages. He had such an influence on so many of us in terms of igniting our passion for biblical studies and connecting our interest in culture and history and language, connecting those interests with something far more important, something that transcends and isn't transient, which is the heavenly divine scriptural teaching. Uh, I mean, and in fact, I recommend various books to various people, but I have many people always asking about Orthodox Christianity, or even if they're asking specifically about the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, I almost always start them off with St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, Torah to the Gentiles, which is your book. Uh, I have Father Paul Nadim Tarazi's book on Galatians as well. I've, I've read it. I will say it was very insightful. 
there are certain things that I'll never forget. For example, in the Greek text, the existence of the phrase male and female uh, that is often mistranslated as male or female. L little things like that that I would not have known connections with the scroll of Isaiah just by reading his text. But I will say uh, your text is a little bit easier for me to recommend. I've gotten more people to uh, to be able to to chew on on your text, at least as, let me say, an introductory text. And then I introduce them to, to Father Paul's, uh, his entire corpus really needs to be read. And I'm always talking about it on this channel as well as on the Tawahado um, Bible study. So I was hoping you could tell us about uh, Torah to the Gentiles, your book, so that people can read it as well and, and learn. It is a kind of introductory text that deals very much with the scandal of the anti-idolatry school of the Bible. And what now I've come to refer to as the cancellation. <laughs> it's, it's the cancellation of the addressee of the text and really trying to help people understand how the cross cancels the person hearing the proclamation of this teaching and how this mechanism works and the way in which the things that we construct even in our mind function as idols fashioned by the hand of man and how you know and and then of course dealing with the question of identity and how this this emphasis on identity and religion relates to Paul's letter to the Galatians and how ultimately what scripture is trying to show Israel or rather trying to use Israel to demonstrate to the world is that there's no difference between Israel and the rest of the world and how we in a religious setting spend all our effort trying to demonstrate that we're different than everybody else. It's such a scandalous letter. Galatians is so scandalous that every time I hear it read in church, I have to fight the urge not to blush. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't believe that we can survive hearing Paul's letters in church. That's how scandalous they are because it is such, such an ominous critique of everything that we do. But somehow, mostly because we're not putting the effort in to really hear what he's saying, it just goes past people. They don't really hear what he's saying. It just, that's one of the things that really amazes me about our life together as Christians. I think that's how we, that's how we've survived Paul's letters. We do exactly what he critiques. We read scripture with blinders on. Because every once in a while, you take those blinders off, people get pretty frustrated pretty quickly. <laughs> That's what he's saying? Oh, man, I'm not happy. And then, yeah. of course, comes the classic Midwestern follow-up comment. Well, that's your interpretation. <laughs> what are you talking about interpretation? This is what it says. You tell me what it says. Don't tell me about interpretations. What does the text say? I feel like more of an English literature teacher sometimes than a preacher, just getting people to deal with the text instead of their imaginary interpretation that they think they may have heard someone say that takes their conscience off the hook of the fact that Paul just condemned them. Anyways. No, it's, it's, um, it, it, the emphasis on the text, I think is so clear when we read your text on Galatians, because first and foremost, you place the Greek in its entirety right there for people to examine it. Then you place the English as well there for people to examine it so that if for whatever reason there's any mistakes in the English, anyone can go and take something like a Strong's Dictionary or a, a Mount's Interlinear Text and and check and verify the things that you're saying. Does it go tell them, you know, anathema or accursed? Does it go call them uh, bewitched and foolish? Does it tell them to go mutilate themselves? You know, what what is the the scandalon? What is the scandal of the text saying? Could you, could you talk a little bit about the decision to put the Greek and the English there 
uh, side by side? Is it for this point so that nobody could say that you're making it up? Well, I think it's something Father Paul said in the introduction to the Chrysostom Bible commentary, that the sermon is nothing more than an invitation, if that. We give so much importance to the sermon because we give importance to ourselves. But the real subject matter is the text. And in this way, even the New Testament is an invitation to the Old Testament. So the sermon isn't even an invitation, if it can be said at all. So at most, what you're doing in the sermon is trying to present some information about the real preaching, which was already put down in writing several centuries ago, before there was a you and before there was a me. That's why I can't stand postmodernism. They want the you and the me to be functional, but it's empirically untrue because there was a text before there was a you and there was a me. So why would my sermon be necessary except to point out that there was a text and to maybe provide some facts to help people read the text? But ultimately, the whole point of everything we're doing is to have everybody go and read the text themselves or hear the text to be more precise. That's why. So the book isn't really a commentary in the academic or scholarly sense. It's an introduction. It's, in a way, a kind of a sermon, a reflection on what Paul is saying, trying to help give people a sense of what he's saying to the best of my ability, but ultimately an invitation to those reading the book to go read Paul. And by all means, if you disagree, knock yourself out by dealing with the original text. That's, that's really the goal of everything that I'm trying to do as a priest, to get people to take Scripture seriously, and everything that we're trying to do on the Ephesus School Network. There's plenty of people talking about everything other than what God said. We don't even want to talk about what God said. We want to get people to hear what God said. I mean, we're not even in the world of a generation ago where everybody was talking about what God said. We're in a world where everyone is just talking about other stuff. I would be delighted if people would just hear what God said and ignore what men are saying. Or to be correct in 2021, to ignore what men and women are saying <laughs> and just stick with what God said once and for all in his holy scriptures. That's what the Ephesus School Network is, is hopefully committed to. We'll see. All institutions fail, so my hope is very low for the future. <laughs> I can only be responsible for what I'm doing right now, and, and we'll take it from there. Well, we, we appreciate that deeply, and we'll get into that um, further. While we're still on, on your text, I want you to elaborate on, on a point you, you mentioned there that to make sure that our hearers are not just glossing over this point. And it's a point I try to emphasize a lot in the Tawahedo Bible study, a point I picked up from you, Father Mark, and that's uh, you use the term older to refer to the Older Testament or the Hebrew Bible in Torah to the Gentiles. And so what I want people not to gloss over is this idea that there are undoubtedly numerous quotes of the Hebrew Bible in Galatians and throughout the New Testament, people could have two reactions to it. They could have your reaction or maybe a more common American Christian reaction to say, that quote is enough for me, or they can go to your route and be invited, feel invited, and to accept that invitation to go read the, the larger text of the Older Testament or of the Hebrew Bible. What, what do you rank as the importance of the Hebrew Bible as opposed to or in conjunction with the, the New Testament, where the New Testament is inviting people to go hear the Older Testament? It's funny you ask the question. I'm glad you did, because it gives me the opportunity to say that I've changed my thinking since I used that terminology. You'll notice on the podcast, I 
we'll say Old Testament and New Testament, or or more often, we'll, I'll refer to the Torah or the Nevi'im or the Law and the Prophets, the historical writings, the wisdom literature, but gen more generally, the Old Testament and the New Testament, because I've come to understand it, at least at this point in my own educational journey and in, in my own studies, that it's really one text. So when you say older, as scholars tend to do, it's, a, it's something I picked up from uh, biblical scholarship. It mm -hmm. became customary for a lot of people to use that terminology. When you say Older Testament or and Newer Testament, you might you may be buying into the premise that they're two separate books, and I view them as one book. I even I even I think started to say that in a Torah to the Gentiles. But as I went further down that path, really understanding the implications of that idea, I prefer to just say Old and New Testament, and just keep it you know, straightforward and simple like that, more in the more traditional sense. So for what it's worth, I don't use that terminology anymore. I think the way to think about it from the perspective of the canon in its entirety, as it was handed down to us, not by the church, but by the authors who handed it to the church. And that's an important distinction as far as I'm concerned. I think it's important to understand that it's a book that is complete from Genesis to Revelation. And if you accept, uh, you know, Father Paul's argument, it's a systematic book that was written fairly quickly, you know, as a unit. So with that in mind, the way to think of it is, in the, is that the New Testament is the closing section of a longer story. It completes the narrative. Right, it all fits together as one story, and obviously the last chapter by itself, you know, is the last chapter. It's an invitation to go back and and understand. I mean, it, the last chapter is the story of God essentially using His Son the way that Paul uses Onesimus right, as a slave, to finally demonstrate what Israel in its stubbornness refused to accept, which Paul was trying to teach in Galatians, that Israel is no different than the nations. Israel would not accept this. And that's why they misunderstood the purpose of circumcision. It became their protein shake. <laughs> it became their way of demonstrating that they were different, that they were exceptional, that they were better, that they were holier, that their religion, their identity was somehow special and set apart. And that's incorrect. So they would not be humbled by God's law. So God had to humble his son. But that is the last part of the story, the humbling of their king, so that finally we would understand that through Christ, everyone is humbled the way Israel was to have been humbled in the first place. But it's the story of Israel's refusal to be humbled <laughs> that is the meat of the story. Because if it was just about Israel refusing to be humbled, we could have just told the story in the few sentences I just gave for you, the cliff notes. But what I gave to you just now is not scriptural wi wisdom. It's cliff notes. It's not the bread of life. You can't make out of what I just said the bread of life. It's not going to feed anybody. Otherwise, why would you have this big, thick book, even in tiny print in English? I mean, just look at the size of the Old Testament and the size of the New Testament and tell me where the meat is and where the milk is. Come on. It's, it's, it's very obvious. So th in that sense, it's an invitation. It's like if you take, you know, the Harry Potter series and you read the, you know, the last few pages, 
you know, where Harry sends his kid off to Hogwarts. Okay, great. That's nice. He sent his kid and his friend's kid off to Hogwarts and he sees his old enemy and the, it's really touching and so forth and so on. Are you going to say, okay, I, I understand Harry Potter now? No. If that's the first thing you read, you're going to go back to book one, chapter one, because you want to find out who is this boy who lived. It's That's what I mean by invitation. Now, you still want to read all the way through to the last chapter. It doesn't, you know, how do you decide which part of the book to jettison? You don't. You read the whole thing. It's literature. It's literature. Like when I read books to my children, I will play with them and ad lib, and they know Harry Potter, and they will yell at me. At least they used to <laughs> when they were little. They would, they'll yell at, they would yell at me and say, no, no, Papa, stop. Don't do that. Go back and reread it. We want to hear exactly what's written in the book, not what you're ad libbing. Don't mess with the story. We don't want to miss one word. And they would, even if they've heard the story before, they would want to make you read it from book one all the way to the end. Because that's how stories work. That's how scripture works. You have to read it from Genesis to Revelation. So if you start saying older, and then you start saying Hebrew scriptures versus the New Testament, you're playing the identity game and the game of individualism and the game of tribe, which is the American game. And, and increasingly the European game, the Western game. I would like an Orthodox perspective. I would like a Jewish perspective. It's like saying I would like an Orthodox perspective on COVID-19. I don't know. Let's put it under a microscope. Tell me how COVID-19 works when an Orthodox person looks at it versus how it looks when a Jewish person looks at it in a microscope. Does the behavior of COVID-19 change? What do you mean perspective? We want to play the game of, well, this is our perspective. This is our book. This is our way. It's, it's come on. It's, it's, we, it's so destructive. It's so destructive. And every, everything is like, everything now is breaking down into camps and tribes and groups and identities and ideologies. I mean, it's out of control and we're still playing the identity game. And so to my ears, even playing this game of whose scripture it is, is it's wrong. It's God's scripture. It doesn't belong to Israel. It doesn't belong to the church. It doesn't belong to the Jews. It doesn't belong to the Christians. Keep it simple. It's the Old Testament and the New Testament. Some people only read the Old Testament. Some people read both Testaments. I'm fine with that. But let's let's not get too excited about differentiating one from the other. It's dangerous. And the Old Testament by itself is one book. The Old Testament and the New Testament together are another book. So, and in scholarship, they have their reasons for using different names for categorization. I fully respect that. But within our, you know, tradition where the Old and the New Testament together hold authority, for me, it's one book, and that's how I prefer to talk about it. Let's put it like that. Shukran. That's, that's a good way to put it. I want to end this point about getting rid of idols some of my own students, sometimes even long-term students, because different students hear the same message, but take away from it different parts and, and grow at different rates. I know, I know you know this from your years of your own ministry, and I should say ministries, because there are so many facets to it. But sometimes they think, I'm not burning incense, literally, before you know some statue of the Buddha or whatever, from something from Hinduism. And... I don't care about imposing literal circumcision upon someone. And they take this sort of essentialist take. They may not be direct students of, of Plato or conscious of this connection, but they take this more essentialist. Things are essentially this way, but you've mentioned the word a couple times about functionality. So I think you've, you've already mentioned, but just to drive the point home, because repetition is one of our Semitic ways of emphasis. Could you tell our hearers about 
how someone could be functionally imposing circumcision or functionally committing idolatry without literally imposing circumcision and without literally burning incense uh, with a censer before statues. I, I mean, there's a simple example of idolatry, a very simple example. Take the word conservative and the word liberal. The minute you use these categories, you're already engaged in idolatry. You're already, you've already fallen into the trap because you already have in your mind something you've constructed. You're not talking to another person. You're talking about something you've fashioned with your own hands, or you've accepted something that someone else has fashioned. And worse, you're then taking action in the world based on your God. I mean, this is happening left and right in our culture right now. It's resulting in acts of violence. People fashion their idol, the immigrant, the lazy person who's not working during COVID because they're getting paid more. Now, I don't know anybody um, who makes so little that a $600 check is like a, a windfall, but hey, there it is that person is some kind of a monster and a freeloader. So you have this construct of this person you know is stealing all your hard-earned tax dollars that you've invested. You've constructed this idol, and now you act out your anger on the world over something you've invented in your head. That's idolatry. That's why Plato, as Father Paul says, is the serpent of Genesis chapters one through four. We invent, ab we invent abstract concepts all the time. People get up in arms over issues. How are you voting on this issue? What's your stand on this issue? My first question is what's an issue? I've never seen one. Can I touch an issue? But you don't understand, Father Mark, it's important that we know what you think about this issue. I don't think about issues. I don't have time to think about things that have no substance. I'm a Semite. We need to know what you believe about this issue. I don't believe anything about issues because they're non-functional. They're imaginary friends. They do not exist. They are statues fashioned by the hand of man. So what do you do? You construct an issue, and then you decide this is the right thing to think about this issue that doesn't exist except as a crisp, clean, platonic form in my mind. And now that I know what I think about this thing that doesn't exist, I'm going to find like-minded people, and then we're going to organize into a group and we're going to go after people who disagree with what we think about something that doesn't exist except in our heads. That's idolatry. That's the United States in 2021. It's a big joke. I don't care what people think about things that have no substance. I care about what people do because that's what scripture cares about. More importantly, I care about what I do. I don't care about what you do. I'm responsible for myself before God, first and foremost. He's going to ask me what I did, not what my brother Deacon Henock did on that day. And what he's going to ask me is not, what did you think about this issue? He's going to say, how did you treat the person who was in this situation that I put in your path? What did you do for them? What steps did you take to help them, et cetera, et cetera? You know the story. That's my answer to you. 
you know, you heard me on the podcast just this morning. I said it and I've said it before and I'll say it again. You want to know what idolatry is in this country where we worship the dollar? The Christians get up in arms. They want to make sure that it says, in God we trust on the dollar. It's not because they care about the God of Abraham. It's because functionally the dollar is our God in the United States. That's a fact. It's a fact. What do I mean by functionally? I mean, don't look at what people say they believe, just like issues don't exist. Don't worry about people saying, Lord, Lord, it means nothing. Just hear Matthew. <laughs> just look at what people are doing. If in a normal, sane culture, you look to the university scholar, you look to the religious teacher, you look to even the school teacher, you look to the medical doctor, you look to the person who serves the community as the one who is the source of wisdom and guidance for the people. In this country, where do they look? To the boardroom, to Silicon Valley. Because in this country, wisdom comes from wealth, not from wisdom. You have your answer. So don't tell me people here don't believe that the dollar is God. Very clearly, they think that people who make money are wise. That's what they believe. So obviously the dollar is God here. You asked me about idolatry, that's the idol. And what do we hear in Matthew? You can't serve God and mammon, you have to choose. That's the one choice you get. You're gonna be a slave. And as a slave, you have no choices. But God gives you a choice. You can stay a slave to the dollar or you can become a slave of Jesus Christ. Take your pick. But once you become a slave of Jesus Christ, you have to take orders from a new master. And by the way, your new master has a big book. It starts with Genesis, goes all the way to Revelation, and it's full of all kinds of difficult instructions. That's great. We get to pick our master, and hopefully we're not picking mammon. I was reflecting. You don't get to pick him. He picks you. But when he picks <laughs> you, he's giving you, he's giving you the option to accept him or reject him. That's really the choice. If he doesn't give you the option, you can't pick him. So I want to just be clear about that. But anyways. That's good. I played a lot of pickup basketball growing up, and I, I think you did as well. And it's like someone's on the sideline waiting get, to get picked by one of the team captains. Exactly. Exactly. If you don't get picked, you don't get in the game, period. That's right. And it's it's good it's good to to know that stratification, I think, is what people are are missing a lot. And you all talk about that a lot as well on the Bible literature about being a senior and, and being a junior. That that shows up a lot in Ethiopian culture. I I've seen, for example, you know, um, there's this word amha. People translate it as a gift. And what they miss is that in Amharic, the inference is that the gift is always from a junior to a senior. The seniors aren't going around bringing the gift to a, a junior. And so that important point of who's picking, of who's choosing, who's selecting is uh, very well and, and duly noted for us dulos. Thank you very much, uh, Father Mark. And for people who want to reflect on the idea of accumulation of, of wealth. I was just reading Psalm 49 in the in the Hebrew text. Uh, in the Old Greek, it's Psalm 48, depending on which Bible you have in front of you. But check out 49 or 48 as a critique against the accumulation of wealth and service of, of mammon. And, and the call that you're talking about, the personal responsibility of letting God's word be known by the people and that as fulfilling your duty and that's all you could control reminds me of chapter 33 of Ezekiel, that great father of scripture. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about the Bible as, as literature and, and all the 
the other programs now you started off with the bible as literature which is the the flagship but you added terazi tuesdays my own tawahado bible study teach me thy statutes the way dulos vexed and as well as on on youtube ears to hear it's so vast and i don't want to put you on the spot to talk about each and every single one but at least the flagships i think should be spoken about right now so could you tell us a little bit about the the, the creation of and, and the work you're doing with the bible as literature and how tarazi tuesday adds to that although you may want to reverse the order because of that conversation of senior and junior that that we just had well obviously without father paul there's nothing he's our teacher we all owe Father Paul a great debt of gratitude for opening the gospel for us and to us, opening the Bible for us and to us. So when he uh, agreed to come on the program, I mean, he honored all of us by doing so. He certainly honored Richard and I, or shall I say Richard and me? I better get it correct since we're talking about literature. Um, but the the genesis of the Bible as literature was very straightforward. On the one hand, there's a plethora of people talking about all kinds of things online. As I said a generation ago, people were talking about God. Now they're just talking mostly online. And I was desperately searching for anything related to Scripture, especially as a young priest, a junior priest starting out. You know, I'm interested in technology, and if I go online, there's plenty of podcasts and plenty of materials about technology. I thought, okay, that's great. If I want to learn about technology, there's lots of materials I can I can get access to. But if I want to have access to Scripture and listen to people um, reflect on scripture and study scripture, where can I go? I couldn't find anything. Not really, nothing really critical. Not 20 years ago. So I, you know, I started talking to my friends and um, thinking about what we could do. And then eventually the, I was really fortunate the Bentons moved to the Twin Cities. And before then we had been doing a lot of um, lecture series with Father Paul. He had already been producing the Orthodox Audio Bible commentaries. He had been publishing all of his books through OCAB. So the, he, Father Paul obviously is prolific and had been putting out a ton of materials, publishing books and, and, and lectures. And that was obviously immensely valuable to all of us. But when the Bentons moved to the Twin Cities and we started thinking about different projects that we could engage in. The idea of the FSA school as an educational program at St. Elizabeth and subsequently the podcast evolved as, as a way to um, provide education for the parish, but to work on our own continuing education and to produce materials, to make more materials available for other people. The kind of materials that we want access to ourselves the, that we wanted access to and that's how it started uh and and richard and i uh just started recording it was the conversations we were having anyways we just started having the conversations on tape and it has been a really wonderful educational journey i think for both of us we just do bible study together and we record it and we push each other we push the text, we ask questions, and I hope, I hope that our, those listeners who have stuck with us all these years have seen a progression in our own knowledge, in the precision of our methodology, and in the seriousness of our exegesis over time. I do think that we've gotten better over time, and I think the harder we work, the slower we go through texts, and the deeper we dig into terminology. And the work we've done listening to Father Paul and then releasing his podcasts, you know, we, listening, asking questions, and then packaging and releasing his podcast each week. I mean, I can tell you that that has been a, a huge boost, certainly for me in terms of my education. I didn't go to seminary for three years. 
I've been at seminary for as long as I've been a priest, and it's a credit to my teacher. And I, th I think that if there's anything I can say, if there's any encouragement I can give to anyone who's listening, that's the real secret sauce to life. You're not done when you graduate. No one's ever done. And it's very dangerous to have this, you know, professional slash capitalist slash careerist attitude that you get a professional certification and then you can just do your thing. It's very dangerous. You have to keep studying. And it's so amazing, honestly, over the years, the persistent effort and investment made, as in the investment in the paradosis of the talents of Matthew 25. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about church tradition. I'm talking about the deposit of the gospel before the judgment on at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. It's a very serious matter. Like the investment you make in that deposit over the years, that's where the real value is for your education. And it's it's it has to be a lifelong commitment. And I, I'm not talking about clergy. I'm talking about everybody. That's why when people say, what is Christian life about? It, the minute they open their mouth, if they are not only talking about Bible study, they've already lost my attention and my respect because they're not serious. Because I know personally how hard one knowledge of Scripture is. It is a serious matter, and it takes time, and it hurts. As Father Thomas Hopko used to say of blessed memory, there has to be blood mixed in with the ink. And that only happens one way. And there is no time. We have to make good use of the time. So when people open their mouth to speak, and we are not talking about the one thing that matters, the pearl of great price, I immediately lose interest. And I start reciting the Psalter to myself until I have an opportunity to do something else. It's that serious to me, Deacon. I mean, if you look around at what's happening in the culture, it's everybody knows it's serious. Those of us who've been around long enough know that it's not normal the number of school shootings and the number of just shootings in general that we have right now. It's not normal. The situation is not okay, but nobody knows what to do. There is a crisis of leadership. The crisis is that we are shutting God up in a tomb and preventing him from being our leader. We are silencing God because we're filling the room with noise. Anyways, that's that's where I'm coming from. And so you asked what's going on and, and why we started the podcast. I mean, that's the journey we're on. And it's 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 just a drop of it's just a drop of water in, in the ocean. But who cares? Because scripture is God's drop of water. We're all going to die anyways. So we hope against hope and we trust in the mustard seed. It's not a movement and we're not trying to accomplish anything because we don't matter. This is the key. This is how you become unstoppable. You become the energizer bunny of the gospel of Mark. Like Jesus, you just go from town to town, you just keep preaching and it doesn't matter because you know the seed's going to do what the seed's going to do. Ephes, that's what I picked up from your study of Mark. 
I just like it. I just like it because I'm impatient. I'm so happy my parents called me Mark because I'm impatient. I just feel glad that I can live up to my namesake. If this, if this, <laughs> I, 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 if, if, <laughs> I think it should be translated yalla. <laughs> Yalla. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a correct translation, but it comforts me to think that if these could be translated, yalla, yalla. It's a thought for thought. The dynamic translation says this. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're more partial to the the, the, the gospel for modern audiences. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the the dialectical Arabic uh, yeah. version of of scripture. Yeah. It, I, the, the, the disparity or the dichotomy, the false dichotomy people put between laity and clergy, like you said, is something I combat. A lot of people will say, oh, you're a deacon, and that's why you're so into it. But my becoming a deacon was a very accidental matter, and I could talk about that at length with people at another time. But it's another reason I'm glad I had your parishioner and our sister in Christ, Bethany Saros, on the program to talk about her book, Teaching Parents how to read scripture. And I, I always, that book. it's a beautiful little book. It is. And I, I've recommended it to people on this program and, and tell the Sunday school teachers because they're always worried about what curriculum to prepare. I, I tell them that this is another thing to do. You know, let's say you don't have a curriculum. Well, <laughs> your curriculum is Genesis to revelation. And uh, if you haven't gone through it at least one time, as you're telling us to go through it multiple times, then you still have a lot to do. It's people, I think anyone who gets bored with apologies, I won't say that you're saying this, Father Mark, is, is uh, lacking in some creativity or in some intelligence of some form because there's, there's no reason to be bored. We have a lot of work to be done to fulfill our duty. And what you're saying about Father Paul's interpretation of Scripture and reading of, of Scripture aloud to have us and invite us to go hear it has affected me even as I was teaching on on the Psalms. I remember I came across the the Hebrew, which I he helped me greatly to learn after I picked up the alphabet. He helped me practice for about six months very in, in depth. And I have so much more to do. I still consider myself a junior student. So whoever thinks I know scripture, I'm a very junior student of scripture. But even me, I heard this morning um, that the the Adam or the Adamites, humankind, the groundlings are ka behemot nidmu. They will perish or they will end like the behemoths or mm. like the beasts. And to talk about how we value how unique we are and how set apart from the behemoths or the beasts we are. And yet scripture is telling us you may be different, but you're not that different. Uh, you're not special, as Father Paul often says. You're not. You're not. I mean, you're not. None of us are. And that, that is the, that's the answer to everything. It's the answer to everything. Once you understand that Israel is no different than the nations, then everybody can just relax. Just relax. The Americans are no different than the Afghanis. This American exceptionalism, this idol, this ideology is anti-scriptural. It's literally a rejection of Paul's teaching. No one is exceptional. To come back to Galatians, what is exceptional is not Israel, or the nations. What is exceptional is God. What's exceptional is his teaching. Why is that so hard for people to admit? In principle, I mean, it amazes me as a priest, Deacon Henoch. In principle, you tell someone it's God who's exceptional, everyone goes, of course, of course, yes. Yay, God. You say, okay, you agree with me, God is exceptional. His teaching is exceptional. And then you say, but it's the same teaching in the Lutheran church sitting on the altar, the same book. It's the same Old Testament sitting in a Jewish tabernacle. Suddenly we have a problem. We have a problem because now we can't say we're better than the other guys. 
That's the part people struggle with. That's the part people struggle with. You know, and then that's when they want to talk about issues because then you can construct a beautiful statue that explains why you're different than the person who puts their pants on the same way that you do every single day. Doesn't matter if they're Greek pants. <laughs> oh, but Greek pants are different. Uh-huh. They go from right to left rather than left to right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Remember the part where God made you cover yourself or you had to cover yourself because you realized your shame? And now you're telling me that because your shame is covered in the Greek style, it's better than being covered in the Latin style. I mean, it's endless. So identity is, you know, it's identity is, you know, it's the product of imperialism and Hellenism and all this, this nonsense. I mean, Father Paul points this out, you know, in the rise of scripture, like, you were from the place you were from and it didn't matter if the guy down, there was no block. <laughs> we were nomadic peoples, but the neighboring uh, a group of people, maybe they spoke a different language than you and ate different food. But if you're both from the same area, you were from the same, you know, womb. you're from the same earth, the same land, you were the same people, you didn't have to be the same. You only have to be the same when you have an imperial franchise, like a chain restaurant. Ah, oh, what a relief it is that I can go to an exotic country and still get a cheeseburger that looks the same as a cheeseburger in Apple Valley. There you go. And see things in a language I understand. Thanks very much, Alexander the Great, the father of the imperial cheeseburger. We owe the Greeks so much, don't we? <laughs> How's that for cynicism? Not bad, huh? <laughs> exceedingly great exceedingly great thank you Abuna. and you mentioned ocaps earlier so just I, uh, before we head out i don't want to abuse your time today could you just tell people a little bit about the orthodox center for the advancement of biblical studies it's a it's a it's an organization that was established by students from holy cross and saint vladimir's uh years ago committed to the renewal of biblical studies in the Orthodox churches. And since then, OCAVS has established a press. And I mentioned we published several books, including the Orthodox um, uh, Chrysostom Bible series, which is a, a number of books, uh, critical commentaries on the Old and New Testament. Father Paul has written the lion's share of those commentaries, all of them actually. We have a new commentary now coming out uh, by Dr. Richard Benton, my colleague, on uh, Hosea. I'm very excited to, uh, for that. It actually should be coming out this week. We uh, have a number of other books published by uh, people within OCABs. You mentioned uh, Bethany's book. There's a number of audio commentaries. We have uh, an annual gathering, a, a biblical seminar. People present papers. It's just a place where we try to create um, fraternity around the work of biblical studies. It's not, you know, in the. It's not a social group. It's it's a group that gathers around the work of scripture. And, and then there's, there's obviously there's social connection involved, but that, that's secondary. What's primary is the work of Scripture. And I'm just very thankful to have those connections through that work because it's that work that gives us life. And I'm, I'm thankful um, for, the, for, for all of the books that, that, that have been written and, and all of the knowledge that has been made available through uh, you know, God's generosity through his children and, and through their efforts. So you can go to ocabspress.com to see the materials that are available and to learn more about the organization. You can Thank also you. visit ephesusschool.org to see all of the different podcasts that we uh, publish on a weekly basis. Yeah, and the ephesusschool.org is in the bio of every video, but all these other links will also be in the bio of this particular video. In, in parting, Father Mark, 
the last uh, nuggets of wisdom of Sophia of Hakmana that will try to wrangle out of you. A lot of people get frustrated. They tell me when they try to read, we, we talked about the importance of reading the story chronologically, but a lot of people get frustrated beginning in, in Bereshit or in Genesis, and then yes. they quit somewhere in Leviticus or Deuteronomy. Do you have any advice as to how to, to read scripture? I remember in part of your book, you had mentioned about reading one section, maybe multiple times, but do you have any advice for people who, who at least on their lips are saying they want to read scripture more, but haven't found a practical way to do it yet? Don't think. Just let let the philosophers think. Honest to God, don't think. That's why I like the Eastern tradition of public liturgy where you recite the Psalms. There's no time to think. As Father Paul says often, and we've said this on the podcast, to meditate on the precepts of the Lord is not to think about them. It's to murmur them, to recite them. You don't have time to think. You have, well, in Semitic languages, you have to study them ahead of time because you need to know how to vocalize the text. So there's a kind of thinking on that level. But just when you're reading it in English, for example, don't worry about understanding. Just worry about learning. I know, I know all of you think learning and understanding are the same thing. No, memorize it, recite it, just learn the content. Just, just like I was saying at the beginning of the program, I was like 13, 14 years old and I was memorizing the Trapari in Arabic. I didn't know what I was mouthing, but it was exceedingly valuable because I learned how to pronounce the Semitic consonants, which is no small task. And by the time I got to college and started studying the Arabic alphabet, I had a leg up because I had already been exposed to it and had been working on it as a, as a, as a young man. So even pronouncing a language you don't understand has a tremendous value in terms of one's education. So just become familiar with it over and over and over again. That's how scripture works. And read it quickly because it was meant to be heard while you were standing in a public place and you weren't supposed to be able to hit rewind and read it again because someone else was reading it to you, which meant you had no control over it, which meant you had to keep coming back to that public place to hear it again and again and again. Repetition, 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 familiarity. You want the Cliff's Notes. You want the magic understanding. You want the cream off the top because you don't want to do the work. It doesn't take weeks. It doesn't take months. You won't even get it from a seminary education. It won't work. We're talking years of work, years. So just keep doing it, and that's it. It's not magic. You'll get the next iPhone release probably in two weeks. Beta 2 of iOS 15 will be out, but you will not understand the Gospel of Matthew by then. It might take you until the iPhone is canceled before you understand the Gospel of Matthew. Trust me. So just keep reading it. That's my answer, Deacon Hanak. I don't Thank know what you, else Father to say. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> there are no shortcuts in the things that matter. For for those of you who are in the tech field, it's more waterfall than scrum. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of at least the time. Uh, in terms of at least the time. It'll take you time. Yeah, um, it, it, in that sense, yeah, you just have to you have to do it. You have to do it for the rest of your life. That's it. Thank you so much, Father Mark. God bless you. It's good to see you, brother.